Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, braving this weather to, to be here today. Um, I am so excited to introduce Emmeline Butterfield Rosen um, and to welcome her here today. Um, hello to everybody who's tuning in from home. Um, my name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director here for Research, Interpretation, and Education. Emmeline Butterfield Rosen is Associate Director of the uh, Graduate Program at Williams College in the History of Art at the Clark Art Institute, and I understand that she is currently the Acting Director of the program. Uh, she has a PhD from Princeton University. <laughs> she has held fellowships at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and at CASVA, the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. She specializes in modern European art and cultural history. Her broad areas of research and interest include the history of art history and art criticism, philosophical theories of the aesthetic, conceptions of the primitive, the relationship between the visual and the performing arts, theories of gesture, which you'll be hearing about today, the relationship between modern art and science, especially the sciences relating to the human subject. Her book, uh, her new book, Modern Art and the Remaking of Human Disposition, uh, just hot off the presses from the University of Chicago, looks at the way that artists in the late 19th, early 20th century broke with conventions for posing the human figure and how this break might represent a new understanding of human consciousness. It is uh, an incredibly ambitious piece of scholarship. The research that it encompasses is, is staggering. Um, I think it's one of the most brilliant things that I've seen in, in the field, um, at least in, in my area. It's, I'm super excited about it. It's one of those books that just kind of takes you on an, on an intellectual journey. Um, it brings together the history of psychology, evolutionary biology, and intellectual history. It brings all of these things to shed new light on some of the canonical works of European art and dance. And one of those works is The Poseuse, uh, the major work by Seurat, in our collection. Her reading of this painting makes us understand it in a whole new way, as you will see. So please welcome Emmeline Butterfield Rosen. Thank you so much, Martha, for that incredibly humbling introduction and for the invitation to speak here today. The Barnes is one of my favorite places in the entire world, so it's very special to be able to speak here. Um, and thank you also to um, Aliyah Palumbo and everyone for, for, for making the technicalities of this event possible, and to the audience for braving snow, sleet, and hail, which we probably thought we were beyond to be here this morning, so, so thank you. Um, so, as, as Martha said, my, my book is called um, Modern Art and the Remaking of Human Disposition, and, and it, as the title suggests, it addresses a broad topic. It's about strategies of posing human figures that were um, occurring widely across modern art in Europe around 1900. But really, this book grew out of my fascination with a single painting, um, one of the jewels in the crown of the Barnes's extraordinary collection. And I'm speaking, of course, about um, Georges Seurat's poses. And I hope my remarks today, and more generally my book, will um, give you some new things to think about when you spend time in the gallery with this painting. Um, so this morning, I'm going to give a brief overview of the larger intellectual question that I frame in my book, and then a taste of the new interpretation of Pozos that the book advances. And I'll highlight some of the new discoveries about the picture's iconography, which I think are fun and surprising. And I'll say I'm very excited to be here. I have a lot I want to convey about poses, um, but I'll aim to um, uh, be aware of time because I know I may be the only thing standing between you and your lunch or your brunch or mimosa this morning. Um, so my book's point of departure was a simple formal observation. In the decades around 1900, across a range of practices, a new paradigm for posing human figures emerged. 
artists working in various geographical contexts and in diverse media began to present human figures in strictly frontal, lateral, and dorsal postures. And I'm showing you here the canvas that Seurat painted just before Pozo's, um, which means, which is translated in English as models, but it really means more something more like posers. Um, th this is um, a Sunday on the island of Grand Jatte, 1884, which Seurat exhibited two years before Pozo's at the final Impressionist exhibition in 1886. And I see this work as an early and particularly programmatic instantiation of formal strategies that would become commonplace across modern art. By abolishing oblique twisting along the body's central vertical axis, by aligning bodies either um, parallel or perpendicular to the support, by restricting the extension of limbs and often presenting multiple figures in identical positions and orientations, turn of the century artists like Seurat violated some of European figural art's most enduring conventions for disposing the human body. And, and I see this violation as a significant rupture within the history of European art. Certain basic techniques of pose inherited from ancient classical statuary and reinstated, reinstated in the early modern period had held fairly constant in European art over centuries, right up through the moment of Impressionism. The oblique rotation and ponderation of bodies, the variation of postures and gestures among figures, were techniques recognized as indispensable to simulating the human being's corporeal volume and responsiveness to gravity, and perhaps more fundamentally, the human being's autonomous thought and movement. And I'm showing you here an academy where students are training in these figural techniques alongside student drawings by two of my book's protagonists. Um, Seurat's drawing at bottom and on the top a drawing by Gustav Klimt. So my book examines the motivating circumstances and expressive consequences of the repudiation of these inherited conventions of pose. And its broadest and most basic ambition is to show how new concepts of subjectivity being theorized in Europe at this moment were made material in works of art by means of new dispositions of the body. And now I'm showing you another student drawing by Seurat and then one of his studies for the Grand Shop. So I'm realizing I'm making a lot of broad statements. I just, my book tries to particularize these claims by drawing on and putting into conversation four primary bodies of evidence. And so first is a series of artworks that adopt a changed approach to figural pose. Second is the response to these works of art recorded by period critics. And third is a corpus of art historical literature that emerged in the late 19th century that sought to describe and explain distinctive modes of bodily presentation that, are, that were found in forms of art that turn of the century critics and, and art historians would, would have characterized as primitive. And fourth, scientific and psychological and philosophical literature in which new concepts of mind and embodiment were being articulated. And so by moving between these four registers, my book really tries to pinpoint with a new degree of um, precision how um, the kinds of connections that can be drawn between the history of concepts of the psyche and the formal logic of modern artworks. So just to briefly show you the books at the center of the book, the first is um, Pozo's, which Seurat exhibited two years after the Grand Jatte in 1888. And the second work is um, a frieze by Gustav Klimt called the Beethoven Frieze, which was painted in 1902. And the third is a ballet, uh, Afternoon of a Fawn, which was danced and choreographed by um, Vaslav Nijinsky, a Russian dancer in 1912. And I chose these works because each makes particularly clear how transformations in conventions of bodily pose were bound up in really fundamental ontological questions that were becoming urgent across turn of the century Europe. Questions such as, what is human consciousness and what are its limits? Is consciousness the defining feature of the species that gave itself the name in 1758, Homo sapiens? Does consciousness mean that human beings are separate from animals and something special in the world? Um, the motif of the animal is more or less pivotal across all the artists' works that I study. And this animal presence reflects their embeddedness in a new imaginative terrain opened by the intellectual historical event Sigmund Freud referred to in 1917 
as the biological blow to human narcissism, namely the recognition of the animal descent of humankind following Charles Darwin's 1859 publication of The Origin of Species. Equally and inseparably, I suggest that these works engage with a closely related development that Freud extolled as the psychological blow to human narcissism, which was the recognition of the unconscious dimensions of human mental life which were scientifically observed and theatrically exposed in the late 19th century, as I'll show you a bit more with Pozuz. And it's really the aim of my book to show how and why it is that posture is the formal device that enables these art artworks to engage with modern psychological ideas. So that's a broad picture of what I'm trying to do in my book as a whole. Um, and now I'll pivot to um, the actual fun part, which is the picture here at the Barnes, um, which occupies a, quite a privileged position in the argument of my book. And that's also why it's on the cover. Because Seurat, um, through the form and iconography of Pozeuse, and even through his, his painting's title, um, Pozeuse, Posers, is self-consciously, I think, thematizing the very topic I'm aiming to examine in my book, and that is the idea of bodily pose as a central topos of art's history, and also as an aesthetic device that came into crisis around the end of the 19th century under the pressure of new conceptions of the psyche. So Seurat, over the course of his short career between 1884 and 1891, produced seven large figure paintings. Um, or to use the phrase he coined to describe these works, seven grand toiles de lutte, or great canvases of battle. And I think that Pozos occupies a unique position among these works. Literature on Seurat has been understandably preoccupied by his innovations in terms of both his trademark invention of a quasi-scientific system of, pointil of divisionist or pointillist color application, and also his novel approach to composition, which many thinkers in the 20th century saw as a precursor to abstraction. But Seurat's aesthetic innovation appears much less blatant in Pozo's, which has often been described as his most academic or most naturalistic work. And perhaps for this reason, it has proven less intriguing to scholars than, for instance, Parade de Cirque, which is at the Met, and it's a more modest circus sideshow that Seurat painted and exhibited alongside Pozo's, which has been described as Seurat's most radical or most abstract work. Um, and my book, which contains, to my knowledge, the longest piece of scholarly writing thus far devoted to Pozos, and I hope that will change soon, um, tries to restore focus to Pozos and show it's really indispensable to understand this picture if we want to understand more broadly the issues at play in Seurat's entire oeuvre. Um, I think that Seurat's work as an artist was structured by a fundamental conflict, and that conflict, as I see it, is this. Seurat wanted to revive the academic hierarchy of genres that the previous generation of Impressionists, who are primarily landscape painters, had profoundly discredited. He insisted on multiple occasions that he prioritized figure paintings, or the great canvases of battle, over his landscape studies, as he called them. Yet, his figure painting adopted a new manner of presenting the figure um, that in the eyes of his contemporaries really failed to convey all of the uniquely human endowments that in the aesthetic tradition in which Seurat was schooled was what guaranteed the human figure's status as art's most elevated subject. And this is essentially the, the human intelligence, human consciousness. Um, if previous centuries of Western figural art up through and including Impressionism could arguably be understood to share a guiding principle summed up in one um, history of the French um, Academy that an artist who represents the human figure must always remember that he is drawing a man or a human, which is to say an intelligent and impassioned creature and not a thoughtless mechanical being. Seurat found an approach to the human form that challenged this conception of personhood. If a human person, to borrow the provisional definition that op opens the philosopher Hippolyte Taine's De l'intelligence, or On Intelligence of 1870, if a human person is understood as a living body with active members, a refined economy of organs, and a thinking head driven by some interior thought, desire, or plan, Seurat's manifesto painting, The Grand Jatte, presented the human figure in a manner that seemed to subject that conception of the human person to a visual cancellation. 
I want to add, by way of introduction, that Seurat's four years of dutiful study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts is deeply relevant to the conflicted structure of his mature figure painting. And I think, okay, there he is with his schoolmates. Um, um, so he studied there for four years, and I just want to give a shout out to the Barnes Foundation's chief curator, Nancy Ierson, who did fantastic archival research that really clarified the chronology of Seurat's early years of study and revealed the importance of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in his life history. When Seurat entered this art academy in 1876, hands-on instruction continued to consist in a set of practices that were essentially institutionalized in the Renaissance, um, in essence, um, the sketching of antique casts and posed models, and I'm showing you Seurat's, two of Seurat's attempts at this activity. And while this kind of practical training went on relatively unchanged, um, the anatomy curriculum had been transformed to incorporate the most recent research on human physiology, psychology, and evolutionary history. So while Seurat studied in the atelier of Henri Lehmann, who was described uh, by one of Seurat's friends as a master as academic as one could possibly imagine, he was also attending anatomy lectures by the neurologist Matthias Duval. Um, and Duval was close friends with many of the scientists in Paris who were beginning to study the unconscious mind through experiments in hypnosis, and here's Seurat's teacher right here. Um, and in his anatomy course, um, which, is show, which I'm showing you taking, unfolding here, um, he concluded with a discussion of Darwin's um, expressions of the emotions in animals and man from 1872, which, was, which emphasized the unconscious and instinctive bases of human gesture and facial expression. Um, many scholars, in, in particular Jonathan Crary, whose work I'm very much in dialogue with, have, have stressed, um, Seurat's neo-impressionism was predicated upon his general familiarity with some of the most advanced research in physiology and experimental psychology of the late 19th century. But it's crucial to add that he was likely initiated to this body of knowledge um, and to the burgeoning field of physiological psychology, which was promoted in France as a new species of psychology without soul, um, in anatomy class at the Ecole. And I emphasize this because I believe that the academic context, which as you'll see will return in Pozos, is foundational to the conflict that animated Seurat's neo-impressionist figure painting, um, which began with the debut of the Grand Jacques. A work such as the Grand Jacques can be seen as Seurat's attempt to reconcile or even perhaps demonstrate the impossibility of reconciling the grand tradition of figural representation like the one um, taught at the French Academy with the modernized conception of the human subject already being taught under the Academy's auspices. So it's important to emphasize that when Seurat, I think, it's important to emphasize that when Seurat exhibited the Grand Jatte and other divisionist canvases at the first Impressionist exhibition in 1886, his approach to the figure was way more controversial than his new technique of pointillist paint application. Um, the Grand Jatte instigated a major critical dispute about the aims and aesthetic effects proper to figure painting. And while this dispute has rarely been examined in art historical scholarship, I think it's vitally important because it not only specifies what period viewers saw to be at stake in Seurat's new approach to the figure, but also because the artist himself was deeply preoccupied by and engaged with you know, in a philosophical sense, with this figure-focused dispute, as we can see in Pozos. A terse two-line review from 1889 describes Pozos as a, quote, reprinted, corrected, and singularly augmented edition of the Grand Jacques. So by pointedly deploying the terminology of print, this phrase pinpoints the mediating function of art criticism in, um, in conceptualizing Pozos, which Seurat began after the Grand Jatte's debut, immediately after, and executed while he was reading and archiving the copious number of reviews that was, were generated from its year-long three-stop tour of exhibitions. Seurat vigilantly monitored his press, 
Um, a dossier found in his studio contains more than 60 clippings on the Grand Jatte, which were supplied by one of these newly founded newspaper clipping agencies that were founded in the 1870s, sort of like an analog version of Google Alert. And then also there were 33 hand-copied reviews. Um, the very title that Seurat gave to his picture is a word he plucked from a key phrase in one of these hand-copied reviews. Um, La recreation même est poseuse, even recreation is posturing. So to describe poseuse as a reprinted, corrected, and singularly augmented edition of the Grand Jatte is therefore apt. And it captures the very ambivalent status that Pozoz adopts towards the Grand Jatte um, as a simultaneous reiteration and a redaction. The Grand Jatte is a very large 7 by 10 foot figure painting that contains about 50 figures, which range from life size to a few centimeters. And when it debuted, it was the centerpiece of a separate neo-impressionist gallery at the final Impressionist exhibition, where it was framed um, in a doorway and bookended symmetrically between two small figureless seascapes by Seurat. And so this inaugural hanging aggressively asserted Seurat's investment in figure painting over and against the genre of landscape, which is presented as sort of subsidiary here. And yet, the canvas at the center of the display also departed decisively, as I've been saying, from norms of corporeal presentation that were understood to allow for an exaltation of the human subject. And the rigid, repetitive, formally abbreviated depiction of the promenaders really startled 19th century viewers with its seeming technical crudeness. So before examining how um, Seurat's contemporaries interpreted this technique, I'll just outline three related formal features I take as defining um, for the Grand Jatte's technique of figuration. And the first is anatomical. I'm showing you, um, I'm going to show you some details um, of the picture alongside Seurat's student sketches. I think we can say that in the Grand Jatte, Seurat de-articulated his figures. Um, the bodily extremities and members are contained or eliminated altogether. Um, in most cases, arms are carried really tight against the torso so that you, you almost don't see them. Hands are often eliminated or condensed into slabs without fingers. Most men stand with their legs together so that the bipedal stance is um, compacted to a column. And feet are largely eliminated or concealed under skirts so that a sense of corporeal weight of placing, placing weight on the ground kind of disappears. And of course, facial features are also imperceptible or, or blurred. Um, and the second feature is postural. Seurat's promenaders exhibit a quality his contemporaries repeatedly described with a single word, um, stiffness or raideur. Um, whether standing or seated, most of them are posed bolt upright with what one critic described as the verticality of a sundial. Um, they face directly forward um, in a way that many viewers saw as reminiscent of the kind of at-attention posture of soldiers. Um, and the, the, the maneuvering of the limbs, or arms and legs, is minimized. The figures appear um, inelastic and inert. They do not pace forward or extend or intertwine their arms or twist their torsos or turn their necks or tilt their heads. They don't do any of the kind of um, figural techniques that artists were um, instructed to do, as I'm showing in this instructional drawing by Leonardo da Vinci here. So the third and final feature of the body language is orientational. Seurat aligned his figures across the picture plane of the canvas in a manifestly regimented order. All postural torsions requiring oblique foreshortening are eliminated in favor of postures at right angles to the picture surface. So as the critic Felix Fénéon was the first to explicitly observe, Seurat limited himself to a repertoire of three basic body, body positions. His figures are treated rigorously, either from the back or full, full face or in profile. And, and the phrase he uses is ou de dos, ou de face, ou de profil. So, a range of critics responded very enthusiastically to the figureless seascapes that Seurat included on either side of Grand Jatte. Um, but the Grand Jatte's gang of petrified beings and immobile mannequins, as one critic described them, provoked um, 
hostility and laughter. Um, Fénéon recalled in retrospect that the public's rage became fixated on the Grand Jatte's figures and then noted that in particular the foregrounded bustled woman and monkey pair in particular provoked paroxysms. Only Fénéon and a small minority of supporters, mostly affiliated with the new avant-garde movement of symbolism, appreciated Seurat's approach to the figure. Um, one critic stressed this discrepancy after the close of the Impressionist exhibition. Um, I quote, the hieratic aspect of the Grand Jatte's figures excited the dumbstruck hilarity of the public and on the other hand, the approval of a rare few who understood. These polarized reactions determined positions when a, within a broader debate over the question of whether Seurat in moving forward could or should even continue to work as a figure painter. After the Grand Jatte's debut, many critics um, publicly urged Seurat to completely abandon figure painting um, and only do landscape. But directly countering these admonitions, several symbolist writers encouraged him to pursue it further. So chief among them was Fénéon, um, who became the Neo-Impressionist group's principal spokesman. His review of the Impressionist exhibition ended with a polemical prescription for how Seurat should carry his project forward. And he stated, the naked human body would be Seurat's ultimate subject. He said, la peinture au point, or painting in points, imposes itself for the execution of smooth surfaces and above all the nude to which it has not yet been applied. That Seurat's legitimacy as a figure painter was debated in this manner indicates that the Grand Jatte raised fundamental questions about the limits, goals, and purposes of figure painting as such. And I think that the rift the Grand Jatte exposed concerned at its core the deeply held assumption that a painter should endeavor to convey the physical and intellectual liveliness of a human figure. If an academic theorist like Charles Blanc, who Seurat read assiduously in his youth, asserted that figure painting's primacy over genres like landscape was rooted in the basis that the human being, I quote, manifests the highest degree of life, which is to say, thought. Seurat seems to privilege figure painting on an entirely different basis, which is no longer wedded to thought as the fundament of human existence. The problem that most critics had with this painting, which was articulated most forcefully in an indictment by Georges Carl Huismans, was that there was not enough life in it. That's a quote, not enough life. And more specifically, uh, this critic characterized the insufficient liveliness as an absence of inner life. He says about the Grand Jatte's figures, pick away the colored fleas that cover Seurat's characters and beneath them is a void. No soul, no thought, nothing. So the majority of Seurat's detractors were not that explicit. They articulated their perception that there was a lack of inner life or consciousness in these figures by comparing them to various modern mass-produced objects. The two most common comparisons were the fashion mannequin, newly ubiquitous in window displays of modern department stores, and toy soldiers, specifically flat tin soldiers um, mass produced for export in Nuremberg. Um, and there were powerful visual motivations for each of these comparisons. Seurat's numerous studies of silhouetted, often virtually headless female torso suggest he may have actually looked at the mannequin bust to define the contours of his female figures. And it's not difficult to see how the circles of dark green shadow underneath the Grand Jatte figures and their strict profile postures recalled those tiny poured metal figures that, often, that always balance upright on grass green painted bases, most often in profile, uh, marching forward. And I won't elaborate on this now, but I think it's clear that undergirding these analogies that viewers saw to mass-produced effigies was the recognition that this formal dimension of the picture was making an, insertion, an assertion or an insinuation about human psychology. Um, in the book, I argue that the reception of the Grand Jatte's technique of figuration was influenced by a preoccupation with suggestibility, hypnosis, and sleepwalking that pervaded 1880s French culture. 
um, period audiences saw something in Seurat's mannequin-like or toy soldier-like figures that they associated with a new concept of human mental disposition in which the role of conscious thought was radically circumscribed and unconscious and instinctual impulses and in particular unconscious imitative impulses were acknowledged as dominant. And in my book, I spill a good deal of ink trying to show how the fashionably bustled woman with her leashed pet monkey in the foreground of the canvas really condensed this constellation of associations, manifesting in visual form something akin to the proposition that the sociologist Gabrielle Tard advanced in 1884. Um, Society is imitation, and imitation is a form of sleepwalking. Through the figure of the monkey, I think Seurat framed the imitative behaviors of Parisian metropolitan life at a particular moment in history, 1884 CE, uh, within a far more macroscopic historical lens encompassing the evolution of humanity as a species. And in the Grand Jot, an animal with striking formal similarities to period caricatures of Darwin and Darwinian theory serves as a powerful visual emblem for lower rather than higher forms of life or intelligence and perhaps for forms of experience in which instinct as opposed to conscious thought were understood to be dominant. So the majority of critics, as I'm emphasizing, responded very negatively to Seurat's figural technique. Um, and perhaps more fundamentally, they were responding negatively to what that technique insinuated about um, the human mind and human consciousness. But by contrast, um, Seurat's symbolist supporters, I think, appreciated the picture for precisely these reasons, although they articulated that in very different terms. Um, these critics praised Seurat for, I quote, conferring hieratic austerity to human beings. Um, and for them, the strength of the picture was precisely um, Seurat's abandonment um, of techniques of figuration understood to undergird the illusion of consciousness within the human figure. They praised the Grand Jot for attempting to, quote, flee the poverty and insignificance of the classical tradition and return to primitive forms. In 1930, the art historian Robert Ray observed that the Grand Jot appears to have identified and implemented the formal law postulated in the Danish art historian Julius Long's 1892 book, The Representation of the Human Figure in its Earliest Period until its apogee in Greek art. What a title. Um, Neither Seurat nor his critics could have possibly been familiar with this text. Um, the Grand Jot predated uh, Long's book by six years. Um, but this little known yet influential book, which coined the term frontality for the lexicon of art history, is very helpful in specifying what was at stake in the praise of Seurat's supporters for his hieratic figuration and the claim that he had fled the classical tradition to return to primitive forms. In this book, Long argued that a single development, the invention of a new type of pose in Greek sculpture in the fifth century BC, had, I quote, strictly speaking, created European art. Um, after scrutinizing a range of figural objects that Long termed primitive, including ancient Egyptian and Assyrian, as well as modern Oceanic and native North American examples, um, he claimed to have detected a universal restriction governing the posture of the human figure in the art of all primitive cultures, which he christened the law of frontality. This law prohibited artists from introducing any torsion along the, art, the, the body's central vertical axis, demanding that figures be presented in attitudes in which a strict vertical line could be drawn down the torso of the figure to evenly bisect it. For long, Greek art of the fifth century BC was a development of world historical import um, because artists broke with the law of frontality for the first time in history, and in doing so, manifested a new conception of human interiority. By introducing the technique of incorporating oblique torsion and asymmetries into the pelvis, trunk, and neck of figures, Long argued that Greek artists had found a method of corporeal presentation corresponding to a conception of the human being in whom everything is directed and determined by an interior center, 
an interior center that Long rendered in French as Le Moi. Seurat's perceived negation of this conscious moi, or interior conscious center, I believe, was what most troubled critics about the Grand Jot, but also what Seurat's supporters found most compelling about his approach to the figure. In 1887, in a programmatic statement naming the aims of Seurat's neo-impressionist school, Fénéon challenged the prevailing assumption that a painted figure should outwardly convey its consciousness. In a sardonic passage that was certainly directed against Huismol's recently published denunciation of the absence of soul or thought in the Grand Jot's figures, he mocked the pervasive tendency to condemn Seurat's figures for their lifelessness. He said, critics in love with anecdotes whine, you're showing us mannequins, not humans. These critics are not bored of portraits that seem to question, guess what I'm thinking. So here, in no uncertain terms, Fenial implies that the conventional appetite for a certain kind of simulated thoughtfulness in figural art had become outmoded. So with these responses in mind, let's return to the moment of poses. When its tour of exhibition was completed, Seurat reinstalled the work in his studio, and as one of his friends recalled, he re-examined it with ever-renewing anxiety, searching for its smallest faults and always trying to satisfy its conscience, his conscience. So this fraught re-examination of the Grand Jot in light of its critical reception is the key to comprehending Pozo's. In one sense, we can understand Pozo's as a throwing down of the gauntlet. By painting this picture of life-size figures, Seurat obviously was defying the many critics who had urged him to stick exclusively to landscapes. Instead, he took up Fenial's challenge to paint the nude in an obvious attempt to respond victoriously to critics who charged that he was powerless to evoke a figure. But as a public statement, the poseuse betrays ambivalence as much as defiance. Through its interplay of reproduction and deletion, repetition and difference, poseuse serves simultaneously as an apology for the Grand Jot's figuration and a reassertion of its essential challenge. So I suggested to you that the problematic quality of Seurat's figures for period viewers had to do with the way in which their bodies were posed their stiffness and their obedience to the law of frontality, which eliminated oblique angles to position each figure from the back or full face or in profile, as Fenial said. Um, so Pozo's sort of does and does not repeat that strategy. Obviously, the three nudes positioned from left to right are from the back or full face or in profile to recapitulate that restrictive orientational schema. And indeed, Seurat rather insolently insisted upon it by hanging a posterior padding for a bustle, like the one worn by the monkey's mistress in Grand Jat, on a peg on the wall just to the right of the de profil figure, thereby resuming the cycle of eau de dos, eau de face, eau de profil, in the form of a grass green uh, imitation ass pad turned around to face and moon the viewer. And I would note that discovering that this item protruding from the wall behind the models is in fact a rear end bustle pad um, was kind of a, an interesting moment in my research process. It's previously been identified as a bag. And when I began to understand how systematic and blatant Seurat was in making the posos refer back to the Grand Jot and specifically refer back to features of it that provoked hostile reaction. And certainly there's a kind of crude humor going on here in hanging this undergarment facing out so prominently on the wall. Um, I think Seurat is playing with an ancient kind of symbolism saying to his critics in a sense, you know, kiss my ass. And yet, as much as it's strident, poses can also be seen as a kind of retreat or admission of guilt. Um, perhaps most notably, even as Seurat frames the painting around the two figures that provoked most wrath from the critics, so the bustled woman and her pet monkey. Um, so Seurat foregrounds the woman, and yet he uses um, one of the nude models to camouflage the monkey, to, to delete it. Um, and to delete this figure, which I think crystallized the prior picture's um, most obvious evocation of a realm of unconscious instinctual life. 
And Seurat's posturing of bodies also seems to concede to the critics who found insufficient liveliness in his stiff mannequin-like figures. The three nudes adopt um, three distinct and comparatively supple postures. One critic observed that Seurat had been visibly wounded by the objections to the prior canvas and that he had abandoned the wooden rigidity of the Grand Jot's figures and its delight in static attitudes. So while Pozo's was obviously produced in collusion with Fénéon's avant-garde agenda, it could at the same time be understood as the remedial exercise of a chastened Ecole des Beaux-Arts student, a self-imposed endeavor to pass an official test of figural competence. And this at least was how one critic understood it. He said of Pozo's, Seurat has a large canvas which in his mind will make the academy swoon with jealousy. He is not afraid to tackle the academy. Um, so the academy as a designation for a specific kind of um, figural study of the nude model and also as a pedagogical context in which specific figural practices and representations were taught and sanctioned was I think a self-conscious subtext in Pozo's. The painting not only returned to the stylistic terrain of academic classicism, but it ins insistently referenced the artist's school. So foregrounding the life model is the most fundamental way that Pozo's invoked the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was colloquially known as the Ecole du Modèle. And indeed, it seems that Seurat viewed the nude model as the token of his education. We know that he displayed an academy, a painted study of a nude man, on his studio wall as a souvenir of his time at school. And the illegible vertical sheet pinned up behind the standing model um, in poses is perhaps a placeholder for this um, academic relic that Seurat retained in his studio. More generally, the hundreds of academies that Seurat produced while at school the countless hours he spent participating in the attend attendant rituals of the life class are certainly not incidental to poses, um, which return to the life, the life posing session in theme, if not in practice. So by placing a model in the center of his studio, Seurat was implying that he is returning to the Catholic academic practice of working, quote unquote, from life, and a practice which in fact we, we think played an extremely minor role in the genesis of the Grand Jatte. So Pozzoza's academic overtones are established not simply by the depiction of a posing session, but also by the specific postures that are adopted. In the 1880s, the adjective academic was applied in a pejorative sense to figures, quote, given the conventional pose of the atelier. And in that sense, Seurat's posers are paradigmatically academic because their attitudes demonstrably evoke and quote a classical artistic canon. The two studies for the central figure uh, of, of the picture demonstrate that Seurat initially solicited his model to pose according to the hieratic template of the Grand Jatte. In both, the model is rendered in strict obedience to the law of frontality, her head and torso are oriented directly forward in a stiff and upright stance. But before exhibiting the, min the miniature version of the painting's central figure in 1884, Seurat made, which, which he just enlarged to human scale in Pozo's, Seurat made several calculated revisions to the figure. He separated her legs and shifted weight onto her back foot. He considerably enlarged her head and cocked it off center. He added delicate facial features. He relaxed her arms. He gave her hands and he interlaced their fingers. And he created her characteristic gesture, described by one critic as hands simply clasped slightly below the pudendum. And with these changes, I, I think we can say that the little poses reenacted essentially what, what Julius Lang would call the, the Greek revolution in miniature. So by breaking with the law of frontality to introduce an asymmetrical contraposto, Seurat recapitulated what was perhaps the most hyperbolically uh, celebrated, uh, theoretically freighted stylistic development in the history of European art as it was being defined at this moment. Um, the moment when, uh, to return to the language of Long, um, an interior center or a me is ostensibly discovered within the figure. 
So if critics had bemoaned the absence of soul or thought in the Grand Jatte, I think Poseuse set out to correct that defect by bringing these intangible entities back into the picture. Um, and so to do so, Seurat employed practical, time-tested solutions for conferring inner life upon the figure. And he falls back on certain conventional techniques of pose. Um, by switching out of the Grand Jatte's hieratic postural mode, Seurat was very easily altered the expressive presence of the nudes, as it is attested by an immediate shift in the critical rhetoric. So while the Grand Jatte promenaders were described again and again in terms of stiffness, the, the nude models were described in terms of their suppleness. Um, and this physical suppleness, crucially, was explicitly linked by critics to a sense of vitality in a broader sense. Um, that is, vitality of mind, of being, or of consciousness. So one critic wrote of, of the nude models, one feels that these supple, alert, and smooth women are ready to live, to charge, to laugh, to will. Um, another critic, interestingly, described the central model as contemplative. Um, and rather than alluding to toys or Egyptian reliefs or primitive sculpture or fashion mannequins, critics began to speak of the nudes in terms of their seamless compatibility with the grand tradition. One critic referenced Ang, while Fenéon described the central model as a figure that would glorify the haughtiest of museums. So if Seurat's contemporaries were able to apprehend a deliberate evocation of a grand tradition in Pozos, it seems that they did not recognize just how deliberately, though, the nudes were aping iconic attitudes from the classical canon. But scholars now agree on sources for the two peripheral nudes. Um, it's, it seems clear that the left seated model is an homage to um, the dorsal bather that um, Ang recycled throughout his career, um, uh, especially given that Seurat had been charged with copying after Ang while studying in the atelier of his former pupil. And the model on the right, it seems clear, um, quotes um, the Roman sculpture, the thorn puller, um, a sculpture of an adolescent boy um, pulling a thorn from the sole of his left foot. This was one of the most widely copied and popular of all antique statues, which would have been familiar to um, Seurat through textbook illustrations and plaster copies and photographic academies that circulated among Ecole des Beaux-Arts students. But a specific source for the central model's pose has not yet been attributed. In general, there's a strangeness to the figure that, have, that has been difficult for scholars to decipher. It's been noted in general that she recalls the antique statues that Seurat drew in his youth. Um, and because her folded hands cover her crotch, some have associated her with the Venus Pudica or Modest Venus. Yet the central model's unembarrassed outward gaze, the resolute quality of her stance, seem to me to oppose this erotic type, which is characterized in all of its variants by pressed thighs and a coy sideways glance. I would like to propose a different visual source for the central model's pose. I think that the crucial elements of the central poser's pose, a contrapposto stance with weight shifted to the right foot, hands clasped below the waist, um, a quality of seriousness in co countenance, correspond closely to a Hellenistic portrait of the orator Demosthenes attributed to the sculptor Polyuctos. The fact that Seurat introduced this pose in tandem with the white circular sheet beneath the figure resemb resembling the base of a statue reinforces a reading of the central figure as alluding to a sculpture. And I think there is strong evidence to suggest that it might be the Demosthenes in particular. The Demosthenes sculpture was created in commemoration of the orator's fierce resistance to the Macedonian conquest of Athens. Um, it stood originally in the Athenian Agora on a base bearing the following inscription. If you had strength equal to your intelligence, O Demosthenes, the Macedonians would never have ruled the Greeks. Two full-scale copies of this statue survived, Roman copies, and only, and by the end of the 19th century, it was claimed that very few statues were better known. And we can at least know that it was well known to Seurat, because he would have confronted a copy of the Demosthenes daily on the premises of the Ecole. 
The facade of the main building is decorated with a par parade of sculptural copies by winners of the Rome Prize, including an 1831 version of the Demosthenes. So it's as if Seurat drew back to the literal gateway through which he had entered the academic tradition in Pozos. He counteracts the Grand Joff's deviation into primitive figuration by superimposing over it a parade of classical figures echoing the facade of his school. Indeed, the formal and conceptual principle of the facade's decoration, a horizontal row of figures spaced at regular intervals, an arbitrary inventory of unrelated specimens from the classical canon, does resonate in important ways with Seurat's treatment of the nudes in Pozos, who are in one sense presented simply as three statues in the classical bearing, as one art historian observed in 1920. At the same time, it's different than, it's different than the facade of the school because it's not an arbitrary assortment of quotations. Seurat very clearly ordered the nudes to create a legible, if ambiguous, narrative. Proceeding from left to right, we can perceive a single model, um, or it's, it's somewhat ambiguous whether there's one or three models, I think deliberately so, but we can read perhaps a single model waiting to begin her posing session, then holding her position, and then finally getting up to get dressed and depart the studio. And within this narrative framework, Seurat's use of Ang's bather and the thorn puller make a certain kind of sense. The bather translates easily into a tra transitional moment of naked repose, and the thorn puller practically begged for an adaptation to ladies' stockings, which was a favorite uh, motif of 19th century erotic representation. And I'm showing you here, for comparison, a fantastic corbet from the Barnes collection. But I think the logic driving the Demosthenes quotation is far less self-evident. Um, a monument to the most forceful of Attic orators is far from an obvious reference for uh, the depiction of a working class adolescent female who strips down naked and poses for hire. Yet precisely that incongruousness must be recognized as central to the larger thematics of poses. The model in the Demosthenes pose occupies the physical and narrative crux of the picture. Um, the climatic moment in the painting's narrative sequence, when the poser, referenced by the painting's title, presents herself in a pose to be painted. Um, and indeed, this central figure served as a kind of mascot for the painting, standing in twice publicly for the larger composition in the small preview that Seurat exhibited in 1887, and also in a pen and ink replica, which he published in a magazine while the canvas was still on view. So the, the quotation's potential significance, the significance of this pose, I think can only be grasped from within the larger context of an intervention into the prior figure painting's reception. If the Grand Jatte was perceived to have voided the illusion of the human figure's thought or consciousness, the Demosthenes was, by contrast, renowned in the 19th century for being a particularly, I'm quoting an 1882 textbook here, a pregnant representation of the interior life. 19th century descriptions of the sculpture all emphasize that it projects the intensity and intentness of the orator's cogitation, that it's a monument to inward life, indeed to inward life in its most elevated manifestation, um, the rational intellect in the throes of cogitation, um, which enables uh, political conviction, uh, the human subject's resistance to being conquered or vanquished. So more than simply relapsing into classicism, in Pozo Seurat quite surgically extracted and placed at his picture center a classical posture associated with thoughtfulness. And significantly, this posture already had a rich quotation, quotation history of being used in this manner. Scholars have pointed to a long iconographic chain extending from antiquity through early Christian art to Caravaggio, in which figures adopt the Demosthenes posture to indicate moments of reflection or meditation. Though the original sculpture by Polyuctos was displayed in the Athenian Agora with a base, 
that basically specified what the object of the sculpture's meditation was, what the figure was thinking about, answering the question that Fenio mockingly formulated as, guess what I'm thinking? The pose of this thoughtful sculpture was apparently readily detached from specific meaning, context, and even gender, becoming what the art historian Salvatore Settis describes as an image, sign, and iconographic scheme for meditation. Assuming a canonical posture of meditation then, derived from a famous monument to a charismatic male political agitator, the central model of Pozo's demands to be seen in some sense as the depiction of a thinking person, or perhaps more specifically as the depiction of a thinking woman with considerable intellect and capacity for self-determination. It is just this suggestion of an active and conscious contemplation structured in and through the quoted pose of the figure that would seem to invite a potentially feminist reading of poses, which was a picture Seurat did compose at a moment when the liberal feminist movement was gaining ground in France. And it is possible to read the Demosthenes pose as a device that dignifies the central model, um, while also distinctly desexualizing her. Compared to the mannequin-like woman pictured behind her, the central poser appears somewhat androgynous and with an almost masculine bust. And she projects this quality of contemplative inward life that seems deliberately opposed to the instinctual life evoked by the monkey's mistress behind her. And yet, Pozos makes propositions about the inner life of the female subject that the painting leaves profoundly unresolved. For there is also a sense of travesty that undercuts Seurat's invocation of the highest faculties of human thought through the person of this naked uh, figure, a kind of feminized Demosthenes stripped bare. If Seurat intuited the original meaning of the Polyupto statue, apprehending that the Demosthenes was in essence the figuration of a thinker, we can ask whether the artist intended to retain that connotation as he transposed the pose across genders. As Naomi Shore asserted in relation to Auguste Rodin's contemporaneous sculpture, The Thinker, um, the figure of a woman cannot be substituted for that of a male thinker without evoking laughter. Indeed, as she notes, period caricatures of Rodin's sculpture as la penseuse, uh, the female thinker, attest to the perceived absurdity of such a figure. So while Pozo's sustains a conflicted and open, ultimately open-ended reading that I think is a antithetical, such a simple kind of punchline visual logic, Seurat's figuration of his central poser as a thinker is also in some sense a travesty of the very notion of a thinker. And this travesty necessarily hinges on the ambiguous but conspicuous presence of a professional model who mediates the recovery of the classical poses um, that stand in pointed contrast to the Grand Jatte's hieratic and unconscious seeming figures. Seurat's iconography spoke very knowingly to the trade secrets and social context of modeling in 1880s Paris. He debuted the poses in the same year that the journalist Paul Dofus published the first book-length study of the modeling profession. Journalistic interest in modeling peaked at this moment because there was a recognition that the Parisian modeling populace was undergoing significant demographic transformation. Non-professional models were increasingly being hired to pose for artists as a range of artists strove to reimagine the model's role in the compositional process. Seurat's contemporaries like Degas or Rodin, for instance, began to organize their posing sessions with the specific intention of subverting academic art's perceived dependence on what the poet Rilke described as the repetition of pre-approved movements. Um, so Pozo sits somewhat curiously in relation to this development because it seems that it employs the model precisely to um, regurgitate certain pre-approved movements, like, for instance, the, the thorn puller. It's possible to read the scenario presented in Pozos as restaging a kind of audition that Seurat might have witnessed in his Ecole des Beaux-Arts life class. As one student recalled in 1889, 
The models who arrived Monday morning at school seeking employment for re weekly posing sessions would, quote, give their repertoire of poses, turning themselves de dos, de profil, de face, with dignified or furious gestures. The student William Chambers Morrow also described these Monday morning solicitations and described how many of the professional Italian models still favored at the Ecole created their repertoire of poses by spending idle hours studying the attitudes of figures in great paintings and sculptures at the Louvre and adopting these poses when presenting themselves to artists. But, the, but Moro, who was writing in 1899, emphasized that these kind of studied attitudes no longer impressed a younger generation of artists. The trick is worthless, he wrote. Pozos seems to perform one of these worthless tricks. Excuse me. So Pozos seems to perform one of these worthless tricks. It shows a model cycling through what appears to be a repertoire of poses, the bather, the Demosthenes, the Spinario, turning herself um, from the back to the face in profile as she cycles through these poses. More broadly, I think the painting alludes to the way in which the model's repertoire of poses might be molded by certain pre-approved movements, artistic prototypes precisely organized for the exteriorization of inner consciousness. The central figure in Pozos can be seen perhaps as conjuring a posing scenario analogous to the one captured in an 1890 photograph of a male model that we know Seurat drew while at school, a certain Gelon. And we know from student anecdotes that Gelon um, possessed particular skill and enthusiasm for exhibiting himself in poses meant to evoke the cogitations of ancient rulers and literary characters, a skill that he seems to be um, practicing in this photograph where he appears with his fist clenched, his head cocked, and his chin resting on his hand in a traditional um, gesture of pensiveness. Um, the pose Gelon is assuming here seems carefully calibrated to aid an artist in producing an image that will precisely beg the question, guess what I am thinking? It's a point of some interest that Fénéon praised Pozos as a masterpiece, despite the fact that Seurat served up precisely what he condemned in his criticism. The central model coquettishly summons up a false inwardness and the studio contrivance that Fénéon understood to coincide with it. The, quote, irritating image of a model who poses. But Fénéon's ecstatic review of Pozos suggests that he perceived a radical subversion of those conventions in it. Indeed, his description of the central poser strongly implies that he saw her to be unconscious and in a state of hypnotic trance. He is, she is, he writes, standing on a square of linen, her arms at rest and her hands united, her eyes contracted from the fatigue and ecstasy of the pose. There's ample evidence that Charcot began his spectacular public demonstrations of hypnosis in 1878 the hypnotic seance and the posing seance began to present themselves to both artists and psychologists as somehow analogous. Certainly, we know from student memoirs of an enthusiasm for hypnotic experiments among the École des Beaux-Arts students, some of whom attempted to replicate some of Charcot's experiments in hypnosis on female models. More broadly, popularization of hypnosis enabled new recognition of the ambiguous mental condition inherent to the posing session. Dolfus's book on artist models characterized the act of modeling as one that fostered the extinguishment of thought and consciousness. Look closely at a model who has stood for several minutes on a posing table, he wrote. Not thinking, the eyes fixed in vagueness, without seeing, some models actually find ways of putting themselves to sleep with their eyes open and resting like that. Others, and there are more than one, reach magnetic slumber like a catalepsy. I would like to propose in conclusion that the central model in Pozos offers a fundamentally double conflicted subjective presence, simultaneously embodying thinking and not thinking, a kind of thoughtlessness. 
That duality is manifest in the enigma of the central model's facial expression. While these effects are difficult to perceive when examining Pozo's in its current perch, when one studies the painting at eye level, her expression seems to oscillate between vacuity and knowingness. Her eyes shift between glazed and communicative. Her lips at times seem curled in a kind of beatific, archaic smile, at times stern and pursed as if on the verge of elocution. In that sense, she is both a departure from and a return to the core problem raised by the Grand Jatte, a return strongly underscored by Seurat's title, which referred back to the review of the Grand Jatte, in which Seurat conflated the act of modeling with, with the instinctual imitation, imitation, the kind of instinctual life embodied by the promenaders of the prior canvas, for, who, for whom, as the critic said in his review, even recreation is posturing. Thank you. Thank you, Emmelyn. Um, you will be able to find Emmelyn sitting outside our shop, um, signing books, um, which are for sale in the shop and also on our website. It was amazing. Um, but first, I would like to, if it's okay with you, invite questions from the comments from the audience. Delighted. And also, if anybody at home has uh, a question, just type it into the chat, and I will read it from my phone. If you have a question, uh, yeah, raise your hand. We have this box. It's called a catch box. Um, just talk right into the top here. Um, and it's actually meant to be thrown. So you can pass it <laughs> or throw it. Since so I have a question up front. Oh, microphone too. Uh, yeah, very, very thoughtful. Uh, great. Um, Thank you. What, I'm trying to. Maybe you could speak a little bit about Sarat's thoughts on, I, I guess, on the unconscious. Uh, was he trying to make that argument? And 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 it seems like you develop the the argument of conscious thinker, um, active thinker, willful very, very well, and then the unconscious part seems to come from, uh, as I understand, it seems like her facial expression. And maybe you could develop, maybe I missed why she's unconscious here. Um, that, that's the piece I'm, and is that really his argument? Is it that these, we are unconscious actors and, and that's a reiteration of the grand shot right, right here? Yes, I mean, I think the, the argument that, that, she, that she's unconscious here um, is an argument that I make by placing the, the painting in kind of like a discursive context that Seurat would have known from the time, which was advancing the idea that kind of the act of posing, of standing for a long time um, in front of people is this kind of act, which is one in which you're, one is particularly um, inclined to sort of go to mental sleep and sort of turn off. And so I think there's this paradox in, in the central figure of the idea of going to sort of going into a state of sleep while you're embodying a pose of intense mental reflection and cogitation. So that's kind of the paradox of, that I see in um, the, the central figure of poses. More broadly, what are Seurat's... Um, but so, so the fact she's a poser to begin with is the unconscious element. Well, that basically that the, the practice of modeling yeah. reveals certain inherent tendencies gotcha. of human behavior and mental disposition and brings them to the foreground. Like there are certain situations and activities in which these kinds of states come to the fore in a more um, visible manner and that posing, the act of posing, was recognized as such at this moment. More broadly, you know, I don't know what Seurat thought about the unconscious. I do know he was, was deeply immersed in physiological psychology, specifically kind of new research about the retina and the synthetic properties of the eye. So for instance, you know, the, the continuous vision that enables, you know, the, 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 the kind of recognition of the way that the mind works that enables the new medium of cinema in the late 19th century to be invented, the idea of Continu persistence of vision that the eye 
synthesizes unconsciously kind of various data to produce a continuous image. That's at the core of Seurat's pointillist technique, the idea that the eye is going to unconsciously synthesize all these dots. That's his idea, even though in practice it doesn't really work. So it, it's at the <laughs> core of everything he's doing, and it's at the core of what he's learning. But I can't say what he thought. He's a laconic guy. He doesn't write it out for us. But I think what we can do is make a proposition based on formal evidence and also based on what his contemporaries saw. Mm -hmm. No, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is so persuasive, so well done, um, Thank you, and Andre. such a such a stunning reading of this important painting. I can I can already hear the puns, you know, so so intelligent about intelligence, you oh. know. <laughs> um, uh, 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 great. So I I would love to press you a little on an on a, on one of the more implicit arguments okay. you're you're making here and with the book, which is that broadly speaking, modern art starts in the mid 1880s right and that something around posing and so on starts then there and and i i would love to hear your full justification for that choice because i think one could come along as as you on occasion did by sort of evoking Degas that um that there is a prehistory to this right and and what happens in the sort of 25 years between the publication of darwin and its first reception in france around 1860 and the mid 1880s that's sort of a 25 year yeah. stretch that's plenty interesting where i i think you know what Manet does to frontality if we believe yeah. freed and what um, uh, what he then does to socializing the academic pose and making it this sort of cultural modern life phenomenon. And then someone like Cezanne comes along and undoes that in, in his early work so profoundly. And, and he knows the, uh, the kind of earlier generation of scientists and uh, uh, psychologists, psycho um, uh, analysts of the 1860s already, then the Impressionists come along and really undo all forms of posing in the way that you've described Degas. And it seems to me then, at that stage, Seurat is able to reinvest all of this undoing and redoing with this new form of posing that you're claiming. So I, I, I just want to hear you, 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 in a couple of sentences, make the claim that that the change oh, is sort of there, you know, that, you that's, my, that's my, um, that's <laughs> you know? Well, thank you, Andre. That's such a, it's such a great question, and you're right that I would say, and I'm, you, I'm only allowed a few sentences, and so I feel, so I'm inter interpreting that as allowing me a sort of escape from this very hard question. I think you're right that there is a, Modern art is a sort of boogeyman cipher that's sort of traveling throughout the book. Um, I, I, I have tried not to use the word modernism. I would say that in some fundamental sense, I, I have to be honest that defining the history of modern art or, or thinking about beginnings with, with respect to modernism was not what, I, I, I think I had to almost be productively um, unaware of that question while I was working, but I think it's obviously incredibly urgent. There's, there is no way in which anything, any of the problems and topics being taken up by these artists at the end of the Impressionist, and also there's an implicit historiographic argument too, by beginning the narrative with something that happens at the end of the Impressionist exhibitions. And of course, I mean, I'm talking to one of the world's foremost scholars of on of Impressionism, I'm sure that you, you, you pick up on that. And I, I, it's, there is something post-Impressionist about this, and exactly what is post-Impressionist about it would need to be carefully defined and thought out and argued in a more sophisticated way than I've yet done. Something about it has to do, I think for me, with a reassertion of the figure in a way that it kind of went I mean, Degas, obviously, though, is the artist that, like, like Rodin, you know, one thing that I didn't say here is Rodin has this important role throughout all the chapters of the book as a sort of counterexample of an artist who was 
pushing certain conventions of body language to their very limits and collapse. I would say that Degas, who's an artist who I think is deeply interested in Darwin just as much as Seurat, is doing kind of the same thing. The artists that I am working on, I think, are going in a different tack. They're not pushing forward with body language. And I would say that something new is happening with respect to the emphasis on the human figure. And um, I've already way exceeded my sentence limit. It also has to do with symbolism. And, and I think, and I'm, I'm just going to close there because. <laughs> This is so fun. <laughs> Anyways, um, this was an amazing talk. I was Thank really you. grabbed by um, your argument about the central figure and the Demosthenes pose. And I couldn't help but notice when you had the wall at the Ecole, how they had the different statues. There was actually, it looked like a Venus right next to the Demosthenes. So yeah. I was wondering your thoughts on maybe the feminist angle of this reading and how maybe that could be seen as a deliberate uh, rejection of the Vetus Pudica to uh, take a more thoughtful pose. So if you had any thoughts about that. I think it's more like a collapse or fusion of the two. And again, sort of, I, I was just having a debate recently <laughs> with someone who is in this audience about the important, like, about arguments that tend towards ambiguity and irresolution and how frustrating they sometimes are and how much they can be a cop-out and my tendency to always, like, head right for them. So um, I would say that there is no way, I think the, the, the oscillation between the potential feminist reading and a, and a fundamentally anti-feminist reading, one that actually goes further in denigrating the female subject, because obviously the unconscious, the instinctual life of the unconscious, it's not just anybody's unconscious. Um, why is it that the, the female is the kind of test subject that that gets acted out upon? Um, so that, that's, that's being invoked here. So thank you. And I was wondering, um, you know, Fenéon comes up again and again in the yeah. talk and is like this very important but sort of subtle player throughout. And yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a little more explicitly both like historically to the relationship between Fenéon and Seurat, but also kind of to the way that you're conceptualizing Fenéon's role in like, is he pushing kind of Seurat in a particular direction that maybe Seurat wasn't going himself? Or like, you know, how do you see that relationship as it plays out in this work? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, Fénéon, Félix Fénéon, is an absolutely fascinating historical figure who was recently the subject of a quite wonderful exhibition at MoMA um, and at the, at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris about his activities. I mean, he later became um, a, a quite prominent anarchist, and he was accused of, um, throw, um, of throwing a bomb in Paris, and he had a very public trial. At this period, he is... Um, He's, he's really, he, he, he's an incredible art critic who writes for just a, a short period and, and it is, his emergence as an art critic kind of coincides with Seurat and I think, I, I think they're pushing each other for the, I mean, they had a fraught relationship. Seurat was, I mean, I can't emphasize enough how intense he was about his criticism. I mean, all artists at this time, I mean, and it hasn't been said enough. I mean, Martha Ward was the person who first brought attention to this, or at least the way that I learned about it, these clipping service agencies um, that began in 1879, I believe, that all artists, you know, you go to Rodin's archives, Signac, they all have these little clippings of their criticism. I think Seurat brought a certain intensity to that. He wrote to critics saying, you called me an innovator nine times, but you called him an innovator this many times, and it's not right, and I would like to prove to you. So he is a very, very fraught relationship. I mean, it's it's not unlike our current. They're living in a fully socially mediated world. 
And you, there's no inside and outside to that. I mean, artists don't work in isolation, especially in an increasingly mediated world. So they're in dialogue. I, I would like to ask a question. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> I want to hear you uh, talk a little more about, um, I can't remember, what's the name of the garment hanging on the wall, the bustle? The, the tournure. The tournure. Uh, the, well, yes. Uh. Um, because if he's, if he's, you know, making, if he's saying something about sort of the performance of the pose of consciousness, how does the fact that he is in, including that garment play into that? Because it really does seem to relate, God, <laughs> sorry, so much to, the, it belongs to that, to the standing figure, right? Like it just, you just sort of know that it does. Yeah. Um, and um, aside from it being his way of kind of mooning the audience, mm -hmm. what is, how does it play into maybe what he is saying about consciousness well, and, and, the, and the sort of performance of it? Does it is it part of the undoing of, of that? Yes. I mean, one of the things um, that I didn't go into, because I, I, I already probably went over and I couldn't, this is part of actually my favorite part of my chapter, but I had to painfully like not really discuss it here, is all about the tale. Um, the tail of the monkey and the way in, and the relationship between the monkey's tail and the bustle of the woman in the grand jat and the kind of relay of mimicry between the two figures that kind of presents her as informal um, alignment with that kind of animal figure. And I think, and um, the, the, the bustle was also called an imitation tail. So, so the, the, the ambiguity between this kind of like contemplative thinker and the kind of figure of, evocative of instinctual life. I think um, the, um, the hanging the um, false ass, which was what it was also called up there, is, is reasserting it and making it so that she can't escape from it. And also something that I talk about, oh, sorry, um, <laughs> is, is this really, really strange shadow. So she, this has, back when we were in, when this painting was in Marion, I thought maybe there's some kind of weird optical illusion from the window where it was hung. And, you know, it took, and then, and then when, when the painting moved, I talked with the conservator, Judy Dion, like, is this from where it was folded? What is this? Because it makes absolutely no sense, no visual sense in relation to a light source. But it's just like a reverberation, a shadow of the bustle from the prior picture. It's like she's overshadowed by that tail from the other picture. It perfectly echoes the contours of that false ass from the prior painting. So I think that's part of the ambiguity. Oh, well, there's a red dot. Oh, um, uh, it, it per so, it, so it, it's another way in which she can't escape from that. It's the, it's the undoing and the assertion at the same time. Um, but yeah, when you go into the, oh, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> When you go into the gallery, please look at this shadow and, and think about it in relation to the figure in the Grand Jot because it's very bizarre. And once you notice it, you kind of can't unsee it. It's, it's the bustle. Okay. Um, I think we need to wrap up. Um, unless, is there one more question? Okay. Um, thank you so much. That thank you wonderful. for the invitation and for the wonderful questions.